Hello, hello, and welcome once again to another edition of a podcast that we call Things We Said Today. This is a Beatles program that centers mainly on what's going on news-wise in the world of the Beatles. I'm Ken Michaels, one of the co-hosts of the show, best known for the syndicated Beatles show called Every Little Thing, and I'm being joined by my co-host, the writer for Beatles Examiner and many Examiner columns, Steve Marinucci. Hi, Ken. Hi, everybody. On today's show, we're going to be talking about a book that came out on John's birthday, October the 9th, and it's called The John Lennon Letters. And this book is comprised of mainly letters that John Lennon wrote throughout his lifetime to various people. He wrote to uh, friends of his, to fans, to people in the media, a variety of people uh, in this book. And we're going to talk about this book and, and share our feelings about it. And Steve, first of all, got to ask you whether or not you enjoyed reading the John Lennon letters. I, I very much enjoyed reading the book. There was a lot of information in it that I thought was new, that was new. Even more interesting, I, I, I thought it was very revealing as far as John goes. Um, there was a lot that, uh, a lot of the stereotypes that you have about John, or I should say some of the stereotypes about John don't hold true in the book. He comes across at various times in the book as very soft-hearted, very loving and not the hard-edged guy that everybody, you know, that that his image is. And there's just a lot of inside uh, information from various points in his life that has that have has not been covered in in various books. And when it has, it, it obviously didn't have the insight of the letters. Right. It, it brings a lot of a lot of that to the front. So I think it's a very valuable book. I think it probably it probably was not expected to be as valuable and as good as it is but it's it's really good i think it's a it's a great book and mm. the nice thing it, I, it was assembled by hunter davies who wrote the beatles biography it was assembled without editorial um direction by yoko ono yoko didn't have any say right um so there was really a lot of uh it, it's just it's just a well done just a well done book that's basically what it boils down to. I mean, I remember reading in your own column about this that Yoko did not interfere in any way with this book, and it kind of reminded me very much of the Lenin in, in New York City uh, project that came out. Yeah, except I think this is a little bit. In that different. regard, I'm saying because Yoko didn't really, she didn't have any input. Right, right. This is, like I say, though, this is a little different because, I mean, Yoko. You figure Yoko has probably had probably seen not all the letters, but at least some of them that were in there, um, because you know some of them came from you know stuff that she had. But there are some that she probably had never seen, and it's really wonderful that that they gathered them all together. And of course, a couple of the letters made big news right away. The one where he goes off on George Martin, mm. which I really think. You know, in in the context of the book, is kind of is really minor, and I don't think it indicates any any kind of extensive conflict with George Martin at all. Well, let me tell you something. I really enjoyed this book myself, but when I first heard about it, there was some trepidation on my part because I felt that John Lennon's life was so much out there. He said so much. He was so revealing in his interviews and in his music. How much can we learn that would really shock us? And, and there were there were articles out there asking that question of whether or not this was too much. And I think, I don't see how you can ask that question with a book like this. With some of the second-person biographies, you know, you can ask that. When people are, whose connections to the Beatles are, you know, are slim, Mm. you can ask that question. But this being that this was, these are his letters, I don't think you can ask that. I think this is an even better book overall than uh, Barry Miles uh, many years from now. I think a better much- book? I, I don't know about that. I mean, you've got, in that book, Paul talking about all the songs from the Beatle days and commenting about them, something that a lot of people have craved for. I, I, I think it is because Paul, I think, tends to manage his what comes out about him, and I think he, I think he had a lot to say about the Barry Miles book, whereas the Lennon book is basically raw linen, hmm. you know, unadulterated linen. And I think that's that's the value of the linen book. 
Um, maybe if we ever get a Paul McCartney letters book someday or a George Harrison letters book, which that would, that would be interesting, or a Ringo Starr letters book, that would be, you know, those would be very interesting. Right. Um, but like I said, this is raw and adulterated, you know, as far as it goes. Lennon, and I think that's that's the really good thing about it. I think one of the things that you in particular appreciate, and you were kind of just saying this, is that you see the, the tender side of John right. in these letters. But I do think that it's very important, like you were just mentioning the the letter written to George Martin, that you also see the bitter side of him, because it's all those sides that made up who John was. Right. You see all sides of John. But, uh, and, and I think that people tend to focus in on things like that George Martin letter as major points, as, as you know, big, the biggest points in his life or, or the most important things in his life. And while, you know, you, you don't want to ignore something like that with George Martin, at the same time, the history, of the, the long history of John Lennon and George Martin would really put that kind of an incident in, in, kind of in the background. It really takes it out of context, and I think that's, you know, that's important, too. Well, why is that taking it out of context? It's kind of like saying that when John wrote, How Do You Sleep?, you know, he really didn't have those feelings for Paul, even though John said that in an interview, that he was just writing his, you know, his frustration and dealing with Paul and putting that into a song. He said that's what that was, but how mm -hmm. do you know that he didn't really feel those particular feelings. Right, and that's exactly with the with the with the incident with the with the uh George Martin letter that, you know, that everybody kind of focused in on as far as the book goes and and so I, you know, I mean, I think uh, like I said, I think you have to put the whole, you know, John's whole relationship with George Martin into context and there were so many, I mean, the Strawberry Fields Forever work up for example. I mean, that was a case where the you know the two of them got along you know where they worked together mm. um at the same time there's also the you know there's the uh let it be thing where he where uh, they didn't want uh you know George Martin involved and that you know right that's you know there's too many incidents to to kind of slam to to make a big deal or I shouldn't say make make a a major major you know turning point in their relationship because the way things went there have been so many incidents between them in the course of from the beginning to you know even after the Beatles that you know something like that really doesn't make sense to, to make it you know as important as it as some people were trying to do. Well, the letters to George Martin and to Paul McCartney were used to help sell the book. Mm -hmm. I mean that's what would make a splash. Sure. Can you believe what John said to George Martin? Or to Paul McCartney. And actually, you know, I, I've heard, especially during the 1970-71 period when John was at his most bitter, I've heard similar things said. And, and that's why and I'm saying that nothing really shocks me. The thing is, if you're a student of John Lennon and you followed everything that he said in, in his interviews, he changed his opinions all the time. Right. To the point where you couldn't hold him down to one particular opinion about certain things. You know, he could be blasting Paul McCartney one minute and praising him the next. Right. And that's the way that John was, and you have to understand that about John. But right. that doesn't mean that when he does blast, or when he does say, when he praises somebody, that he didn't mean it at the same time. Sure. There are many sides to any one person, and John was, to me, a very complex person. Exactly. You know, and who's to say that we're all not that way in many right. ways? It's, it's a matter yeah, of I, evolving I was, and changing your opinions through life. I was going to say that, and for somebody like John Lennon, who you know, is whose life is focused on so intently, you know, to pinpoint one little incident at one point in time and make that, you know, and and blow that up, the way, you know. I mean, there are, of course, there are incidents going along all the time, for, you know, in public life, but um, I think you also have to look. You can't forget the, the overall picture. And right. And sometimes that does happen, and, and with things like that. But um, I mean, the book is is a is a great. I think it's a it's an excellent reference material, excellent source of reference material for the way John was. And well, it, I just I thought that I would read just a little bit of this letter to George Martin, so the people who are listening right now can know exactly what we're talking about. Sure. 
He says here, and this is actually written to George Martin and to Richard Williams. This is in response to an interview that George Martin gave to Melody Maker. This is back in 1971. And apparently George Martin was taking too much credit for the Beatles' success, at least in John's eyes. Mm -hmm. And um, John says here, when people ask me questions about what did George Martin really do for you, I have only one answer. What does he do now? I noticed you had no answer for that. It's not a put down. It's the truth. I sent the postcard about the David Frost show. And he's talking about a, a postcard that he sent to George Martin because George was very kind to him about uh, the song Across the Universe in there because she said nice things about Across the Universe. For Martin to state that he was painting a sound picture is pure hallucination, referring to Revolution Number 9. Ask any of the other people involved. The final editing Yoko and I did alone, which took four hours. Of course, George Martin was a great help in translating our music technically when we needed it. But for the cameraman to take credit from the director is a bit too much. Those are powerful words there. Mm -hmm. True. And I, I, I can't, you know... I, he is John Lennon. He has a right to say what he has to. But George Martin, I had the chance to interview George Martin with a friend of mine a good 10 years ago. And one of the things that I remember about the interview, I said to George Martin, I can't imagine what a song like Strawberry Fields Forever would have been like had you not been the producer. And George Martin said to me, Strawberry Fields is a great song before he was ever involved with it. And I was kind of taken aback when he said that. Because mm -hmm. I'm, I'm thinking, you're being overly modest here. <laughs> George Martin did not give me the impression that he was taking the credit for the Beatles' success. He has said on numerous occasions that the reason why the Beatles' music has this lasting value is because the music itself is strong. The songs are strong. It all comes down to the material first. And the production can play a very big part in the way that you appreciate the music. But if they're not strong songs first then it doesn't really matter too much what you add to it. So he was really giving credit there to John for writing a great song. Right. It was a great song, if you listen to Take One on the Beatles anthology, that's a great recording right there. It's still a great song anyway, but I still think what George Martin added to that song in terms of the production, the arrangement that he did to that, you know, that helped to really shape the whole sound and what we experience when we hear it. And I, don't, I didn't think that George Martin was really giving himself enough credit. And but I, I understand his it, point of view, though. And I think it's disingenuous for anybody, even John Lennon, to try and take away what he what he did for them. I mean, he did have a role. He may not have composed the songs, but he, you know, had a very vital role in in the Beatles' music. And and uh, you know, I don't know that John was trying to do that. And he might, you know, he might have been, you know, snippy at one point to kind of you know, make a point, but I, I don't think he, you know, he put George Martin down like that all the time. I don't no, I think this is one isolated example. Right. And then there's an interview, the one he gave Dennis Elsus in 1974, where he's giving George a lot of credit for knowing what instruments to use on Beatles songs. He would right. say to them, this is what an oboe sounds like. Right. You know, he is very helpful in knowing what sounds were necessary on Beatles recordings. Mm -hmm. The arrangements that, that uh, George wrote, the string arrangements, the brass arrangements, all of that added so much to Beatle recordings, and it even goes far beyond that. Right. I mean, uh, one particular example that George likes to bring up is Can't Buy Me Love, where he actually suggested that the song start with the chorus of the song. It was going to start with the verse. I'll buy you a diamond ring, my friend. Just an, just an example like that where he made a suggestion to the arrangement of the song and where, where the chorus starts the song, which really was such a great hook to start the song with. Just suggestions like that. It's immeasurable how much he contributed to Beatles recordings. But, I mean, overall, as far as the book goes, you know, there's just so much of that kind of, you know, inside, in-depth information that, you know, so-called biographies don't have. And that's where... You know, that's where I think this book is really valuable, and it's worth whatever you pay to, to get it. Um, I think it's, it's a wonderful book. Hmm. And, Tell me uh, some other things, Steve, that you, that you learned that maybe you hadn't heard before. The letter to Freddie Lennon, I think, was another, uh, was another interesting moment. I mean, we all knew that he had gotten, he had tried, at, you know, uh, to get in touch, or to connect with Freddie Lennon, but to actually read what he was saying um, in 1967 was interesting. 
the letter to Cynthia in 1962 from Hamburg where he says, I love, love, love you, and I'm missing you like mad. Well, there's a lot of letters in this book that he wrote to Cynthia around that time, and you would think he was totally infatuated with her. Right, which makes, which kind of makes, you know, later on even more interesting, but the book is just like pinpoints of his life, you know, hmm. you kind of, it's a, it's a opening a window for, for a couple of seconds to see things that were going on with him, and it's, un, as I said, it's unadulterated, it's, you know, it's him as he really was, hmm. um, and that's what's, that's where this book is just so, so wonderful, so valuable. I want to mention a few things that I found fascinating because I don't want to give too much away in the book. I'd like everyone who's listening that are that's interested in this book to pick it up. But I will tell you a few things. First of all, the fact that he wrote to the fans mm -hmm. early on, that tells you something. Because for all that John said later on, that the Beatles sold out, or he was embarrassed by how much the Beatles had sold out, referring to when Brian Epstein got involved and they had to wear the suits and they shortened their, their act to, to short uh, concerts. You know, he was making every effort back then to connect with the fans and to build an audience and to build a fan base. Right. He wanted, he, he was starving for success just like the other Beatles were. And he was friendly with some of them um, even later. Um, I talked to uh, Lizzie Bravo, who was one of the two voices on across the universe, um, and she, uh, her letter uh, is in is in the book, and she told me the story about that. And I, I I wrote about it, um, how uh, John, how she and John connected, and how they, you know, how how uh, the letter came to be, and that, that and that's kind of interesting, you know. But even later on in life, if you follow this book, there were times when people wrote to John at the Dakota. And he would randomly pick a letter out and write back. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. he, he, he spent time with the fans. And not only that, this may seem like a minor thing to you, but every letter, every postcard, everything that he wrote back, he signed it, love. Did you notice that? <laughs> Even to strangers, mm -hmm. you know, and, uh, or love John and Yoko, or, or love John, Yoko, and Sean. Mm-hmm. Some things that I found really fascinating in this book, first of all, John and Stu wrote to each other, which is not a shock, but in the letters that they wrote, Stu referred to himself as Jesus, and John was John the Baptist. <laughs> um, also, and I found this really interesting, he was writing notes for the Imagine album, and you don't actually see all the notes, because I think part of them were lost, but he was writing about individual songs, and he actually says that, give me some truth, that Paul helped him write the middle eight of that song. Mm -hmm. He never said that anywhere in any interview. And, you know, all the years that you're used to the recordings coming out the way they did and, right. you know, the songwriting credits and right. it says John Lennon for Give Me Some Truth. It doesn't say John Lennon, Paul McCartney. But here's no. the, only, the only time when I've ever seen that John gave credit to Paul for helping him write Give Me Some Truth. Mm -hmm. He also said that uh, How Do You Sleep was George's best solo to date, guitar solo, which I thought was really nice. And also just the fact that uh, the last few years of his life, he was really writing a lot to his family in England, especially his cousin. It's actually, I think, Lila, because mm -hmm. he always there, misspelled it. It's supposed there's to been some, oh, um, yeah, L-I-E-L-A. -E there's, uh, oh no, actually it's... Uh, it's supposed to be, I think it's L-I-E-L-A. -E well, actually, he actually I'm, looking at, I'm looking in the book now, and they've got it. They've got a mistake here. It's L E I, not L I E. But they've got a they've got a, mis, a misprint. Uh huh. But there apparently was um, some word after he was killed that he had actually planned a, a trip to England. It is L E I, by the way. I'm looking through the letters. Now. Okay. You can see it clearly. Um, but yeah, he had supposedly been planning a, a trip to England after you know that would have happened after December 1980. Which is uh, a shame. You know, it's kind of ironic. You follow the last few years of John's life. He did a lot of traveling. Mm -hmm. He went to Japan. He went to Hong Kong. Um, he went to Egypt. And, um, you know, but he didn't go to England, strangely right. enough. You'd think that might have been like the first choice to visit his relatives. Right. There's a one letter here I'm looking at um, where he's talking 
where he's actually he actually wrote a note wrote notes on the Hamburg sessions, the Hamburg uh, Star Club tracks, which is interesting considering that they, you know, they the Beatles stopped them. Which is right. Bad. And it's also kind of ironic. I just finished reading the book the last couple of days, but when I picked up the book, I was in the middle of it, and uh, just a few days ago, we learned about the passing of Pete Bennett, mm -hmm. who was uh, a promotion man that worked for the Beatles and many other artists, right. did a lot to promote the solo records of the Beatles and Apple records. Mm -hmm. But um, it just so happens, I'm picking up the book, and right where I left off, there happens to be a letter that John wrote to Pete Bennett regarding uh, the fact that, that Pete wanted to be a guest on the Mike Douglas show. And um, Pete had helped to arrange John and Yoko being co-hosts with Mike Douglas for that whole week. So that was kind of ironic that that happened then. And um, something else I found really interesting mm -hmm. was that John compiled a list of songs for Mexican EPs on the Beatles featuring George and Ringo. And he had a track listing for each. Certain things like that. that and this all happened... Um, you know, after the Beatle breakup, the fact right. that he was even thinking about that, you might have thought his mind was far removed from the Beatles, but he was actually doing this. <laughs> and he yeah. also, he sent Paul, and this was in 71, in, in the middle of, you know, that heated period there between John and Paul. He sent Paul an acetate of what John thought was the deck audition recordings. But I think, according to what... Um, Hunter Davies wrote, most likely it was uh, BBC broadcasts of some of the same material. But he actually took the time to send that to Paul, mm -hmm. which I found really interesting. There's one other thing that I do want to bring up here, and you tell me whether or not I should give away uh, what's in this book about the Butcher cover and what John wrote on one of them. Do you remember? <laughs> no, I don't. I don't remember. Wait, what year was it? Uh, it's towards the end of the book, so I think it was probably the late 70s. But uh, John actually said that his original idea on the, butch the butcher cover I've, I've got it. was to have Paul decapitated. <laughs> but uh, Paul wouldn't accept that. He wouldn't agree to it. But uh, I don't know if he was kidding when he wrote this, but this is on the inscription on a butcher cover that John wrote, wrote on. So I found that really interesting. There's all sorts of things just like this in the book. And I think it gives you so much more insight. You, you also get to see the style of writing that John had. Right. His, his sense of humor, his wordplay, which if you're familiar with what he wrote in his books, like in his own writing, The Spaniard and the Works, it's very similar. And sometimes it's very hard to understand what John's writing about. You have to really pick apart each sentence and try to figure out what does he mean here. Because he plays around hand, with words but, a lot. But on the other hand... There are several examples of that in the book. But on the other hand, there's also some very straightforward writing, too. Right. Where he's he's not playing around. He's being, you know, he's, he's talking to anybody, you know. Hmm. So, yeah, there's both kinds of John. Yeah, it's... Yeah, I mean, this is just such a such an incredibly informative book. Such a, so it's, it's just wonderful. It really is. Yeah. And also, one other thing, towards the end of the book, there's a list of things that John asked his assistant, Fred Seaman, to go out and buy for him. And if you're curious about what John was into musically, there's a number of things mentioned here. And one of the things that I enjoyed about the Lennon interviews that he gave right before he died, he would mention some of the artists that he was listening to at the moment. It might be the B-52s, because he was noticing how they were influenced by Yoko, or it could have been the Talking Heads, um, he did not denounce disco music. He said it was all a part of the same wave of rock and roll. And then y you see this, this, the list that they have here in this book, and he's asking his assistant to buy Hot Stuff by Donna Summer, mm -hmm. the Roach's new album. <laughs> so he was into a lot of this stuff. He which also, is, which, which is kind of funny because, you know, Yoko went on to, to have a big career in, in, dance music that she still has right know, so. and in fact that one letter you're talking about where where he's talking uh, asking about the music he says ask for a copy of day tripper by jt singer which is interesting that he's actually asking about a cover a uh, beetle cover now you're talking about james taylor oh okay is that what he's talking yeah about? it was james taylor 
he he did a cover of Day Tripper. And it wasn't at that time. It was a few years before that. It was on his Flag album. And I always liked his cover of it. But somehow John found out about it and he wanted a copy of it. Hmm. But just knowing that and knowing the music that he was listening to then, I think he, he referred to Blondie at the time as someone that he liked to listen to. And there's actually um, a letter or it might have been a postcard that he wrote for Ringo. He was suggesting songs that Ringo should cover. Right. And he said, Heart of Glass, he wrote here, it's the type of stuff y'all should do, great and simple. And he cited that song, Heart of Glass. I can't imagine Ringo doing Heart of Glass. <laughs> Neither Sorry. can I. But, you know, just the fact that he wrote Ringo, and, and we find out about this, mm -hmm. apart from the songs that he wrote for Ringo, or that he was considering for Ringo, like Life Begins at 40 or, or Nobody Told Me at the time. But it's just, um, you know, a wonderful book in many ways. You find out a few things about John, or in, for some of us, maybe a lot of things about John that he never knew before, and you really get to capture his, his style of writing, the many different styles of writing, and his sense of humor. And here's you get an, here's another, uh, another interesting letter from uh, uh, Christmas 1979, talking about music. It says, Dylan and Randy, Randy Born Again Newman albums. Right. There you go. <laughs> Oh, you know, I'm just now connecting that because of what you said. Because at the time, Dylan was doing the Born Again thing. You know, really? Got, I, you know, that didn't even that didn't even hit me. But yeah, you're right. I I was just thinking of the two of them separately. But the Randy Newman album was called Born Again. Born Again, yeah. It That's was. kind of ironic. Yes. But he yeah. kind of linked those two together. He right. also wanted a copy of Back to the Egg. <laughs> oh, I see that. Yes, he yeah. did. Yes, he did. So you would think somebody like him shouldn't even have to have somebody go out and buy it for him. <laughs> they should just, think. you know, Capitol Records should have just sent it to him. He's John Lennon, you know, this yeah, is a songwriting you would partner. Think, and I, I, yeah, now obviously things would have been different. Hmm. But anyway, I would definitely recommend getting this book. Yeah, I would too. And if, you know, if you're looking for something, for example, for a, you know, a, a Beatle friend that for Christmas definitely give this some consideration this is a great it would make a great christmas gift for somebody that doesn't have it it is also interesting by the way that in the interview i did with him he mentioned that he's um hoping to do uh, a new uh, edition of the beatles biography and he's also hoping to get more letters linen letters so we can do a volume two so we can do a volume two so, and in fact, he gave me a an email address which I will mention here. It's John Lennon Letters at Hotmail dot co dot uk. If anyone out there has a letter from John that they would be interested in sharing with Hunter Davies, but yeah, that's that's kind of interesting. Um, and you have to figure that even though there's a lot of letters in here, there's plenty that didn't make it, and that's out there that he sent to fans or friends or whoever. Yeah. Um, he didn't specifically, because I asked him if there were uh, enough letters left out, and he didn't say specifically that he, he had left uh, any out, but he did say he, he hoped more would come in. He also said he's doing a Beatles lyrics book with handwritten, with the original um, uh, sheets, uh, lyric sheets. Mm. And I love that. Mm -hmm. and I, I eat that stuff up. <laughs> so that's going to be another interesting book to look forward to. Yeah, if you've ever gone to the John Lennon art exhibit that's been at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, there was a whole floor of just John's handwritten lyrics. I saw the I saw the one at the Grammy Museum. Um, it was a small uh, exhibit. It wasn't a, a big one. It was quite tiny, actually. Mm. Um, but it did have some lyrics, and it had a lot of, you know, it had some some clothing and some you know personal artifacts and stuff, and the, and a guitar. And it was very interesting to see that. Right. Very interesting to see that. And it, was, and it was actually, when I saw it, it was located right next door to the Roy Orbison exhibit, which they had not opened yet. So I, they were, the two of them were kind of bumped into, bumped against each other. It was cool. Okay. So to sum it all up, we definitely recommend picking up this book. Very much. And so. uh, hope that Hunter will have another one in the works, because I yep. certainly enjoyed this one. And if you folks would like to get in touch with us, there's any number of ways you can do so. First of all, we have our own Facebook page under the name of the show, Things We Said Today. You can also check out Steve's own columns, the Beatles Examiner columns, and he has columns for 
Paul and George and Ringo, and other examiner columns too. And the way to do that is by what, Steve? Go to uh, examiner.com and just search for my name. I do, as, as Ken says, I do vintage rock and roll, I do TV on DVD, and I do Paul McCartney Examiner, George Harrison Examiner, Ringo Starr Examiner, and Beatles Examiner, which I've been really busy with lately. There's been some some incredible stuff happening that I've been writing about. Um, so, and Steve is glued to his computer all day long. I'm glued to my long. computer. It's, it's crazy. <laughs> and also... You can uh, check out my own website, which is KenMichaelsRadio.com. You can find out about my radio program called Every Little Thing, which is currently on 18 stations in the country. You can also listen to interviews on the website that I've done with people connected to the Beatles and also play along with Beatles trivia every single week and win terrific prizes. Not only that, we have our own email address now, which is, tell them, Steve. said today, radio show at gmail.com. That's right. And we'd love to hear from you with suggestions of what you'd like us to cover here on the show and uh, just your comments about what you think about the show if you, if you listen on a regular basis and what you might want to hear more of. And you can, you can get the show through iTunes, which, I, which you may be doing already, or you can get it on podbean.com. You can, if you have an Apple device, um, if you get the podcast um, app, you can reach us through there. There's all sorts of ways to get us. Okay, so thanks so much for listening. I'm Ken Michaels, joined by Steve Marinucci. Thank you. And we'll see you next time.